Now, for a planet to cause lensings and orbits a star and to give lots of caustics, we need the angle. Here's the Earth, here's the star, and here's the planet. We need this angle to be about the Einstein radius, which, if you remember, was given by the equation root 4 g m, where m is the mass of the star, in this case, over d c squared, where d is the distance to the background thing that's being lensed. Now, for planet mass, so if, if m is about the mass of Jupiter, which is about uh, 2 by 10 to the 27 kilograms, we knew that the Einstein radius angle was about 1.5 by 10 to the minus 10 radians. But in this case, the mass we want is not the mass of the planet, but the mass of the star. So the mass of the star is about a thousand times the mass of Jupiter. Mass is under the square root here, so that means the new Einstein radius is going to be a square root of a thousand times bigger than the old one. The square root of a thousand is roughly 30, so it's about... 5 by 10 to the minus 9 radians. So that's the angle. What's the actual distance? So if the distance here is sort of halfway to the middle of the galaxy, so about 125,000 light years, then you have to multiply that by the angle to get r. So r is going to be the distance. So that's about 1.25 by 10 to the 20 meters times 5 by 10 to the minus 9 radians. This is using the small angle approximation as usual, which comes out as about 6 by 10 to the 11 meters which is four astronomical units. So to be an effective lens, you need to be a few astronomical units out, which is you know, roughly where Jupiter is in our own solar system. You don't want to be hundreds out. You don't want to be 0.1 out. Uh, so it actually looks like this is ideal for finding Jupiter-like planets. Well, Paul, this is great because you've just shown that the scale where things happen is like our solar system. So we're going to be able to see the things that we know exist, at least in our case. And furthermore, those caustics amplify the effect of little things like the Earth. And so it seems to me that we're on a real bonanza here. Yep, so we clearly need to find some of these things. So uh, we need some telescopes pointing at the bulge of our galaxy, uh, looking at it over and over and over again, and monitoring the stars for ones that start getting brighter in just this right pattern that suggests that there is a, a microlensing event going on because there's some dwarf star in the foreground lensing it. And then we monitor really intensely for look for some spikes in the light curve. So very conveniently, the Milky Way and its bulge is you know, best seen from the southern uh, hemisphere. And here in uh, Australia, starting in 1993, we had a program to go out and use uh, the 50-inch telescope, known as the Macho Telescope, uh, to go out and do a survey specifically to do this event, to go out. And as it monitored the uh, night sky, it could look at the large, and, the large and small Magellanic clouds. But you couldn't look at them all night long. It turns out they do get pretty low. So they could also go through and monitor the center of the galaxy yep. and look at hundreds of millions of stars. So let's remind you of what this telescope looks like today. So in 1993, in this telescope, astronomers started an experiment that did exactly this. The MACHO experiment looked at 16 million stars continuously. As you can tell, this telescope is no longer in working order. It was burnt down in the Great Canberra bushfires of 2003, along with the rest of the observatory. Before it was burnt down, the telescope was fully automatic. It would actually open itself at sunset if the weather was clear, check the weather, focus itself, uh, pick its targets, and analyze the data, and even ring the astronomers up if we discovered something interesting. Yeah, I remember it fondly because it used to send me messages on my telephone. And on the 18th of January, 2003, in the afternoon, there were fires about, and it sent me a message that said, 
temperature out of range, 73 degrees Celsius, and I knew the telescope was in trouble. Here's the remains of the superstructure of the telescope. This was winched out of the burnt out dome and dumped over here after the fires. The main mirror used to sit down here. It would take the light and focus it. That was originally bolted on the bottom here. That would bounce the light up towards the middle there. So the light came up from the primary mirror, entered the top end of the telescope here, and was split into two colors, red and blue, by a device we call a dichroic. And so part of the light went off here to the side, and the other went out to where Paul was standing out the back. Now this telescope was unique because it was equipped with a 64 million pixel CCD array, a big, the world's largest digital camera. And so it was able to collect data faster than any other uh, telescope before its time. So in the 1990s, the 50-inch uh, Great Melbourne Telescope up here at Mount Stromlo was able to do a survey where it looked at the Magellanic Cloud, which is over your shoulder there, Paul. Yep. And that Magellanic Cloud, of course, as the Earth rotated, sometimes it went down very low. So you need something else to look at. And because they were trying to search for dark matter, they needed to sort of calibrate with some other object that for example, shouldn't have very much dark matter in front of it. And that was the bulge of the Milky Way, where we could go through and we could see lots and lots of stars and have lots of test things. And so, in the end, you know, the Macho uh, experiment didn't find dark matter. It was able to rule out many possibilities. But it did find lots of lensing towards the bulge of the Milky Way. And then, in the end, I think that was probably the more interesting part of the experiment as we look back uh, 10 years later. And it was uh, also working with uh, another experiment at the time called Eros that was done out of Chile by a French group. Yep, so they found lots of lensing events, in this case probably dwarf stars, red dwarfs in the um, foreground, lensing things in the background. There was no clear evidence of planets. They didn't have, they didn't observe every star often enough to look at these little planetary glitches you need observations every few minutes. Yep. Whereas this would only observe any given star once a night if it was lucky and the weather was good. So it was, uh, you needed more rapid observations. But it and got so, people excited about it, the possibilities, I think. And it was, became clear that the lensing did actually work. Einstein was right yeah. and he did get these events and you could feasibly with modern telescopes see these things. There's so been a whole bunch of follow-up surveys, for example, Ogle in Chile and Moa in New Zealand. Uh, and these things more or less do what the, uh, the Matcha project did only better with more yeah. modern technology. They have telescopes mapping large areas of the galactic bulge over and over again very rapidly, looking for stars that suddenly start getting brighter. Some stars vary in brightness all the time, you just throw those ones out. But what you want is a star that normally doesn't vary, it just sits there, not changing at all. And if a star like that that's been doing nothing for the last several years suddenly starts getting brighter and has just the right shape of the curve, whoa, alarm. Right, and so these guys have got great software systems in place, and they have many, many years of monitoring. So they're able to sound the alarm very quickly and tell everyone in the world, hey, one of these magnification events is happening, let's all go look at it. Once you know one of these events is happening, you're going to need lots and lots of follow-up. These big telescopes have to keep doing their survey to look for more things, so what they really want is to hand off the follow-up to other telescopes. But they're also only located in one place, and of course the Earth rotates, and so daytime happens or the object gets too low in the sky so you can't mm. see it. So you really need to have objects or telescopes scattered across the globe because if a planet happens, it might just happen when it's daytime at one telescope. Yes, and these planet trajectories are going to be very quick. So what you need is large consortia that are going to go around and when the trigger goes off, start monitoring you 24 hours every 24 hours from around the world as the Earth rotates, a different telescope picks it up, high precision observing every few minutes to look for these sudden glitches.